Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Oh, guys. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. How are we doing today, everybody? There we go. There we go. Well, listen, I want to take a really quick second and greet all of our City First Church locations. If you're in the house, we're so glad you're here. Online peeps, thank you for being with us. Cape Coral, State Line, God Behind Bars. Can you guys give a huge warm welcome to everybody who is joining us? All right. All right. So you guys, I don't want to like scare you, but Christmas is just five days away. Five days away. Okay. We're like down to one hand. Okay. So I have a question for you guys. How many of you, and even if you're watching online, I want you to raise your hand. How many of you have all of your Christmas shopping done and your gifts are wrapped and you're ready to go? You're ready to rock and roll. Okay. Awesome. Well, I just want you to know that we cannot be friends. We can't be friends because I am super way behind this year, okay? If you guys, you know, you have those years where you're totally on top of things. And then you have those years where you're just not on top of things. I am not on top of things this year, guys. It is bad. So I'm sorry. I'm coveting all of you who are all done. Um, I'm just kidding, though. We can all be friends, okay? We're all friends. Um, so we are in our Christmas series, you guys. It's called Hope is Here. You know, the story of Christmas is the story of hope fulfilled. That's what Christmas is. It's the story of hope fulfilled. Finally, finally, the Savior had come. You know, Luke 2 announces his birth to a group of probably the lowliest of citizens, the shepherds. And I want to read it in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, because this is the deal. Our key verse is, is kind of embedded in here. It's verse 10. But I just love reading the Christmas story. Okay, and so we're going to read a little bit about how the angels announced the birth of Jesus to some lowly shepherds in a field. You can join me. The words are going to be up on the screen. It says this, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. You guys, are, these are homeless shepherds living in the fields, okay, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. We would have been terrified too. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Everybody say you. You, to you, he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. You know, verse 10 is our theme verse, and it says, I bring good news of great joy to all the people. The good news that the Savior of the world had been born. The longing and the waiting and the hoping for a savior had come to an end, all right? Because Jesus, who would take away the sins of the world, showed up on the scene, okay? And Jesus, who would make a way for us to have a relationship with the heavenly Father, he showed up on the scene. And Jesus, the one who would heal blind eyes and open up deaf ears, guess what? He showed up on the scene. And Jesus, the one who would bind up the brokenhearted, and he would set the captives free, and he would give beauty for ashes, and he would comfort those who mourn, he showed up on the scene. He showed up on the scene. The Savior had arrived. And this is one I want to remind us of today, you guys. Christmas is not a fairy tale. It is real, it is true, and it changes everything. Because Jesus changes everything. See, Jesus arrived on the scene, and God's plan to rescue us from our sin and disconnectedness with God, it was set into motion. It was set into motion, and people had been longing and waiting and hoping for this for so long. Christmas means hope is here. How many of you are grateful that Jesus showed up on the scene that first Christmas? You know, and as I've been thinking about this idea of hope, of hope, you know, in our culture, I think hope has kind of been viewed as like a cute word. 
You know, it's like a cute word, right? We have it on our Christmas cards with our perfect family photos. We hang the words of hope on the walls of our home. And we even tattoo them on our skin sometimes, right? We have the word hope. I won't ask for a show of hands of who has the word hope somewhere <laughs> on their body. But this is what I believe, that hope is not just a cutesy word. It's a gutsy word. Hope is gritty and it is strong and it is bold and it is courageous. See, because the very idea of hope implies that things aren't going your way. Things aren't going your way. That means that there's something you, you desire to see. There's something you desire to experience and to have. There is something that you are hoping for, that you are longing for, and it's not yet yours. It's not yet yours, so you hope. Which means this, you wait. <laughs> Hoping is waiting, and waiting is this. It is not a fun word. <laughs> See, hoping and waiting are intertwined, but we aren't real good at waiting, are we? I'm not a good waiter. But so much of life, if you think about it, is spent waiting. We wait in lines. We wait at the grocery store, we wait at the Target, we wait at Walmart, it's Christmas season, so we're waiting a lot. And you guys, how many of you are like me that you always choose the wrong line to get in at the checkout? If you ever see me at the store, do not get behind me. You might wanna talk to me, but don't do it, because you will be there really long. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I have a choice, I'm like, it doesn't matter which one I pick. It's always gonna be the long line. We wait at traffic lights. We wait in traffic. We wait for the bears to be good. We wait for Aaron Rodgers to be bad at some point, right? We wait for poor drivers to get out of the way. We wait for ketchup to come out of the bottle. We wait for people. We wait for our kids. We wait for our spouse. I wait for Jer all the time. He's such a diva. I kid, I kid. He's always waiting for me. We wait for the next season of the show we love. We wait for water to boil. We wait for a vaccine. <laughs> you wait for the preacher to be done, right? <laughs> and this is how it goes. We'll be waiting, right? We're waiting for something. And we kind of give ourselves a window, a window of how long we're gonna wait and we're gonna be calm in our waiting. Give ourselves the window. But then once that window passes, right, we start to like get a little annoyed. We get a little edgy. We get a little irritated, right? And then we have to start to take deep breaths. We're like, calm down, calm down. And then we have to bite our tongues because we usually want to say something that we shouldn't say, right? How many of you are not good at waiting? I'm not good at waiting. This is what I know, is that I know those are all funny ways that we wait. But we all know that waiting isn't just for traffic lights and it's not just for doctor's offices. It's for the things that are in our life that have way more significance than that. Maybe you're here and you're waiting for that prodigal son or daughter to come back to Jesus, and you're waiting. Maybe you're waiting for that financial breakthrough. Maybe you're waiting for your body to be healed. Maybe you're waiting for that grief that has just plagued you to fade. You want it gone so bad. You're hoping for the day when you actually feel hopeful, right? Maybe you're single here and you're waiting for that significant other. Maybe you are waiting for a child. You know, maybe you're waiting for freedom from that habit that plagues you. Maybe you're waiting for that loved one to come back to Jesus. We wait. And it's awkward in the waiting right? We want it to happen. You know, many of the verses that are found in the Bible, many of them, the words actually, um, the word hope means to wait or to be patient. That's another word we love, right? To be patient. Well, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 is one such verse, and I want us to read it. And for those of you who maybe grew up in church, you've maybe heard this before, and I want you to listen to it with fresh ears, okay? Let's go ahead and read. It says, but those who wait for the Lord, wait for the Lord, 
who expect, look for, and hope in him will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles rising towards the sun. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow tired. What a powerful promise from our heavenly father that we will gain new strength and renew our power, that we will rise up close to God and that we will run and not become weary, that we will walk and we will not grow tired or faint as some version says. How many of you could use a little bit of that right now? You're like, man, I need a little bit of that. I need to rise up. I need my spirit to rise up. I want to have the energy to run and not grow weary. You know, there's two quick observations that I want us to just look at really quick in regards to this verse. The first thing is this, is that first it says that the writer's hope is in the Lord. The hope is in the Lord. So these things happen when our hope is placed in the Lord, not in us, not in our abilities, not in others, not in things, right? The second is this, and I love this, you guys. This is kind of where we're gonna camp the rest of some of our talk here. Hope is not passive. Hope is not passive. In this verse, I get the sense, okay? I get the sense that it's not leaning back. Hope is not leaning back. It's actually on its feet. It's looking. It's anticipating. When is the Lord going to show up? What is he going to do next? See, I think sometimes we think that hope kind of looks like this chair, this little setup right here. That hope is like this, that it's just waiting, that we're just sitting here and we're like going, okay, what are we going to do? We need God to show up. We need God to do something in our lives, right? Right? And so what are we going to do while we're waiting? Well, I'm going to check my Instagram. I'm going to check maybe maybe some of your Facebook people. Okay, I'm not Facebook. If you try and reach me on Facebook, guys, it's just not going to (laughs) work. I don't know. I still call it the Facebook, okay, like some of you. Um, Or maybe, you know, we're going to call somebody. Or maybe we're just going to sit back. We're going to take a little nap. And this is, we think this is what hope looks like. We're going to twiddle our thumbs. You know, we're just going to hang out a little bit. But I think that hope is not just sitting. See, this is just waiting. But hope actually looks out with expectation. Hope is, it, hope is not just like passive. It is literally going, okay, I need to look for. I'm expecting God to show up. Okay, so if hope isn't just sitting and waiting, how do we hope well? How do we wait? Well, because hoping is just waiting. And again, some of us, man, we're not good at waiting. So how do we wait well in the middle of our circumstances, hoping for what God can do in the middle of that? Well, we're going to talk about that. The first couple things, okay, is this the first thing that we do? How do we wait well? Is this we pray and we prepare. We pray and we prepare. We pray, meaning this, we ask God what we should be doing in the middle of our waiting. Ask God, hey God, I'm hoping for you, hoping for you to show up. What do you want me to do in the middle of my waiting? What do you want me to do? And the second is this, we prepare. We prepare by listening and then actually doing what God asks us to do. We prepare. I want you to remember this chair. Hope is not passive. It is preparing. Okay, we pray and then we prepare. You know, I think that a beautiful picture of the most beautiful picture of a person who is waiting and hoping with expectation is someone who is waiting to have a baby. You know, that's kind of what happens. Like when Mary found out that she was going to have baby Jesus. Well, I mean, first of all, she got told that by the angel Gabriel. That's pretty cool. You know, no pregnancy tests for you. No going to the bathroom on a stick, okay? Or a blood test. You just, an angel shows up. Perfect. Awesome. So what happens when you find out you're going to have a baby? You're shocked, okay? You're like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Well, go back to science class, okay? Unless you're Mary. Okay. And then there's joy, right? There's joy. You're like, this is amazing. I'm so excited. And then there's this phase. Well, here we go. (laughs) This is happening, okay? And then this takes place, the planning and preparing. 
the planning and preparing because there is a really long window of waiting and expecting once you find out you're going to have a child. But that window of waiting isn't spent just sitting on your blessed assurance, right? You're literally going, okay, there is much to be prepared for here. There is something that is happening, something really big that is coming my way, and I have to be prepared for it. And our waiting, you guys, our waiting for God to show up in our relationships, in our families, in our communities, it's no different. We pray and we prepare. We pray and we prepare. We pray and we prepare. Are you waiting for that physical healing? then ask God what you should do in the middle of that. Start taking care of yourself physically. What are some things? Do you need to get rest? Do you need to start eating healthy? Do you need to start making some changes? When you're waiting for that physical healing, what can you be doing? Are you waiting for that financial breakthrough, okay? Make a budget. See what, see what God's word says about money. Okay, we are unashamedly here at City First Church, we follow Jesus and we follow his word. And so no matter what, whether it's our physical healing, whether it is financial, we go, what does God's word say? Because if God's word is the way to go, then guess what? We're going to figure out what it is and we're going to go in that direction. We're going to pursue truth. Are you waiting for freedom from sin? Well, then say, okay, what roadblocks do I need to set up to that sin? Who do I need to tell to help keep me accountable? Do I need to jump in a life group? Do I need to start getting counseling? What do I need to do? As I'm waiting for that breakthrough, what am I preparing for? How am I preparing for that breakthrough? This is a great plug, okay, for what we have here called Growth Track. Growth track. If you need anything at all, if you want to know how to take your next step in faith, if you want to know how to do any of these things that we're talking about, you need to surround yourself with people who are like minded. Growth track is for you. You can check that out on our website. It's four Sundays in a row, starts the first Sunday of every month. We encourage every single person who calls City First Church home to go through growth track. And that can be online or that can be in person. So get signed up for that. Take that next step. Begin to prepare for what is coming next. Maybe you're waiting for a spouse and you're asking God how, oh, I'm, I'm ready, God, I'm ready for that person. Well, then ask God, how can you become the most healthy version of you now? How can you become the most healthy version of you now? Emotionally, mentally, spiritually, how can you do the work now? Are you waiting for that loved one or that friend to come to Jesus? Well, then ask God, God, how do I love them right now? What do I need to say to them right now? How do I serve them right now? So as we are learning to wait well and hope well, the first thing we do is we pray and we prepare. The second thing is this, and it's, I'm just warning you, okay? It's a churchy thing. It's this, praise God. Yes, we're doing all peace today, okay? <laughs> pray and prepare, and we praise God in the middle of our waiting, we praise God in the middle of our hoping. You know, there's Psalm 71 in the Bible, and it's funny because it's actually the header on it, okay, is called, it says this, prayer of an old man for rescue. You know, sometimes like um, Psalms will be labeled, and it's prayer of an old man for rescue. And theologians believe that in Psalm 71, that King David wrote it, and he was at a very, very low place in his life. One of his sons had betrayed him, and was starting to form a coup against him, hey, that's a bad day, okay? My kids just talk back. They're not plotting a coup against me. Hopefully not. And so King David, he isn't in an easy place. And the word rescue me is found multiple times in this psalm. He is hoping for a rescue. And so what does he do? What does he do? As he is writing this, what does he do? What is he doing in the middle of his hoping for a rescue? And this is what it says, Psalm 41 or 71 verses 14 and 15. But as for me, I will wait and hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your deeds of salvation all day long, for their number is more than I know. I'm gonna break that down real quick, okay, you guys? I love what he says, but as for me, 
I will wait and hope. Listen, may there be something that rises up inside of us when, there are, when we're tired of hoping, when we're tired of waiting, when we're like, all right, God, when are you showing up with that rescue? When are you showing up? May there be something that rises up inside of us that says, but as for me, but as for me, I will wait and I will hope. I don't know what my neighbor's gonna do. I don't even know what my spouse is gonna do. I don't know what my kids are gonna do, but I know for me, as for me, I will wait and I will hope. And then he goes on to say, I will praise you yet more and more. The darker it is, the more I'm gonna sing. The darker it gets, the more I'm gonna praise you. I'm going to keep on talking of your righteousness. I'm gonna say it, Jesus, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna sing it out. I'm gonna tell of your goodness. And it says that next, right? My mouth shall tell of your righteousness. The question for you, what are your words speaking in the middle of your waiting? What are you speaking? Because I know this, you guys. Trust me, I've been in seasons where it just feels dark and you're hoping and you're waiting. I know you guys think, well, you guys are the pastors. Everything goes your way, right? No. 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 And so there's been times I'm tired of hoping for God to show up. I'm tired of waiting. And it can become really easy sometimes for my voice and my words to become maybe gripey and maybe complaining and maybe negative. And I'm not saying it's not okay to be like, God, this really stinks. It really stinks. And to have those moments, because trust me, I've had those conversations with God. Okay, so I'm not saying you can't have some words, but then guess what? Guess what? I want us to then to start speaking of his goodness and to start speaking of his greatness because that is what the psalmist says right there. I will speak yet more and more of your righteousness, of your good deeds. There's so many, I can't even get them all out. And so may we be people who praise like David did, praise while he waits and he hopes. You know, the word praise there in that version means to be clear, to shine. Something happens when we praise God in the middle of our hoping, when we praise God in the middle of our waiting, when we lift up the name of Jesus, when we shift our perspective and our focus from our circumstances to our God, things become clearer. I'm not saying that things make total sense. There's things that will never make sense until the other side of eternity, but sometimes then the fog lifts a little bit and you're like, okay, I see what God is up to here. I can see a little bit clearer, okay? So I wanna challenge us as a church, whether you're in the room or whether you're online, I wanna challenge us, challenge us. Don't just praise God on Sunday mornings. Don't just speak of his goodness. Don't just sing of his greatness and his righteousness on Sunday mornings. Let it be something that starts flowing out of your mouth from the moment you get up out of bed in the morning. Instead of going to your Instagram, and I am guilty of this, may we open up God's word and say, God, how can I sing of your goodness this morning? How can I tell of your goodness today? Because my soul needs it. My soul needs it. And so I wanna challenge us to be people who praise God in the middle of our hoping and our waiting. So we pray and we prepare and we praise God. And the last thing that I believe, one of the things that we can do, the final things we can do to wait well is this, pass on hope. Pass on hope. Do you guys know this? That as we wait in hope, there are people who are waiting for hope. See, because if you're in here or if you're watching online and you've met Jesus, you're waiting in hope. But there are people who are waiting for hope. They need Jesus. They need something to happen. And guess what? That person, remember we started out by saying it, Jesus changes everything when he shows up on the scene. You know, as individuals and as a church, we want to be people who say, listen, hope came to us, but it doesn't stop with us. 
It doesn't stop with uh, with us. And that's why we're crazy exhausted from doing all the things we're doing as a church. It's because we're like, listen, hope came to us, but we just don't sit in this room and sing of hope. We say we're gonna proclaim it from the mountaintops. We're gonna proclaim it at schools. We're gonna proclaim it in the streets that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the hope that you need. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 12 and 13 says this. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. That's heaven, by the way. (laughs) I can't wait. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things. Everybody say three things. Three things to do, to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. Trust steadily, hope unswervingly, and love extravagantly. Church, and I don't mean just collectively, I mean each of us, individually, no matter where you're watching from. It is our hope that we would love our world extravagantly. We want to bring people. We want to be people who bring the good news, right, of great joy for all people, that hope of Jesus to anyone who will listen. And that's all of our jobs. It doesn't mean you have to be somebody who's like an evangelist. All it means is this. It's like Jer said, you know, is that we would be people just say, listen, I met Jesus. He changed everything for me. Because do you guys remember, those of you who have met Jesus as the leader and the forgiver of your life, do you remember that day when you had the, the burden of your sin lifted off? Do you remember when you met the hope of Jesus for the first time? Do you remember you experienced the fact that you have purpose now when you knew you were created by the living God and he loves you and he cares for you and you had once relationship with you? Some of you, amen, Jen. Yes, this is good. How many of you remember that? How many of you remember when that happened to you? That same hope. It's our desire that we'd be people who spread that hope. Again, that doesn't mean you have a microphone. It means you smile at the person who's checking you out at Target. It means you maybe invite them to church. It means you love your family when they drive you crazy. It's the small things, guys. We overcomplicate it. I think I say this every time I preach. We overcomplicate it. Let's just be people who say, listen, Jesus, help me love people extravagantly. Help me to love my neighbor. Help me to love the person who's socially distanced from me sitting in church. Help me to love the person who's checking me out at Target or the grocery store or the person who's in the cubicle next to me. I am telling you what, I know it's counterculture, but something happens when we choose to pass on hope in the middle of needing hope. God does something. You know, in the book of Matthew, Jesus refers to his followers as salt. And here in our current culture, salt is more of a flavoring. Okay, but in Jesus' day, salt was meant for preservation. They didn't have a big old refrigerator to store stuff that would break down. And so if meat would rot and break down, salt would be inserted into the meat to preserve it. Church. We are called to go into the broken down places of our world. We are called to go down into the broken down places. That's what salt does. It inserts itself into the things that are broken down, right? In our families, communities, in our world. We don't avoid, listen church, we don't avoid the broken places. Rather, we insert ourselves into the mess because this is who we are. We are called to take the hope of Jesus, the gritty, courageous, strong, bold hope of Jesus into our world. Because isn't that what Jesus did for us? That's what Christmas is, is that he came into the mess and he helped fix it. And so that's what we 
will do. See, hope doesn't just look in, it looks out. And it doesn't just sit back, it goes. It goes. So may we go. So as we wait in our hope, may we be bringers of hope. May we be bringers of hope. So my question to you with this is this, who do you know that needs hope this season? Who do you know that needs hope this season? You might be going, Jen, it is me. I need hope. We'll come back to that in a second. But who do you need hope? Who do you know that needs hope? Who can you spread hope to now? When you leave this place, who can you shoot a text to? Who can you say, hey, I'm praying for you. I love you. And I know it goes counterculture, like I said, you guys, that when we need hope, that we'd be people who give hope. But may we be people who do that. Because the word of God is very clear. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. It will happen. It's a promise. It's a promise. And so my question to us, as we wrap up, more of a reflection. Do you need to be someone who's maybe beginning to pray and prepare? Maybe you're like, Jen, I've just been sitting, I've been sitting on the chair. My hope has been passive, but I need to begin to pray and prepare for what God is going to do. Maybe some of you, you need to start praising God. Maybe some of you, your words have become more complaining than they have faith filled. You're going, that's my thing, Jen. I need to praise God. And lastly, some of you, you're like, I've been so consumed, Jen, with needing hope myself that I've forgotten to pass it on. So if some of you might go, that's my thing. That's what I need to begin to do. And this is the amazing thing, you guys, is that we can't do any of this without Jesus. Do you know that? You can't be good enough. You can't do enough stuff without Jesus because he is our hope, right? He is our hope. And so this is what I want us to do. We're gonna end a little different. I want you to stand to your feet with me and no leaving, please, unless it's an absolute emergency. We're gonna sing that song about my hope is in the Lord. And this is what I want us to do. We're gonna do a little practice, okay? We're gonna praise God in the middle of our hoping, in the middle of our waiting. We're gonna be people who say, I'm gonna choose to hope in the Lord. And so I wanna pray for us. I wanna pray that God would give us the courage to hope like he wants us to. Some of you, I know this, you are facing extreme circumstances. I am not numb to that fact that some of you walked in here with serious things that you are holding on to hope for and my prayer is that you would be infused with a supernatural sense of God's goodness and hope that you need no matter where you are at today so let me pray for us Heavenly Father I thank you so much God for your goodness I thank you God that our hope is in you and I pray for each person who is within the sound of my voice God that you would infuse them with supernatural hope Lord God I know that people walked in here or are watching online who have a heaviness on them and I pray that the hope of Jesus God would settle God in every location right now in the name of Jesus and that we would be people who have walked out of where we're at God with a sense of the hope of Jesus and that God we would run and not grow weary we would walk and not grow faint and we choose to praise you Jesus in the middle of our hoping let's sing to God church is our hope today Your name is higher, your name is greater, and all my hope is in you. Your word unveils, your promise unshaken, and all my hope 
like if everybody could just bow their head and close their eyes. Maybe you're in this house or maybe you're watching online today and you're saying, Jesus, or Jen, today is my day that I want to receive the free gift of Jesus. I understand that he is God's gift to us so that we can have relationship with him. And you know, and all you have to do to be in relationship with Jesus is believe, confess with your mouth, the word says, the Bible says, and believe in your heart. And guess what? You can be saved. And so if that is you today, if you want to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of your life, you're tired of doing things on your own. You're tired of living life on your own. If you want to make him the Lord and Savior, the leader and forgiver of your life with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to just raise your hand, even if you're watching online, there's hands. There's hands. So grateful. It is your day. You get to receive the free gift of Jesus. You can go ahead and put your hands down. And we collectively, as a church, we're going to pray a prayer together. Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, we're gonna say this prayer together because guess what we want? Those who are making that decision to know that there's an army of people with them that are behind them in this decision. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you for coming to earth so that I could have relationship with my Heavenly Father. I confess my sins. I choose today to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life. I receive the free gift of Jesus. In Jesus name. And everybody said, Amen. Can we give those who prayed that prayer a huge hand clap?